So congratulations everyone for signing up for the 2021 clinical and translational summer course. You could be doing something else with your time, but instead you're doing this, that's great. So my name is Dr. Camille Lang. I'm a scientific program manager in the influenza program at the VRC, the Vaccine Research Center, and I function out of the Viral Pathogenesis Laboratory. And today I'm gonna to talk to you guys about the development and delivery of universal influenza vaccine candidates here at the VRC. So before we get into it, <clears throat> I just wanna recap a little bit on translational science and then how it is applied to delivering a universal influenza vaccine. So in general, I'm sure what you understand to date is that the process of turning observations in the lab and the clinic and the community into interventions or solutions that improve the health of individuals and the public at large is what translational science is all about. And these solutions include vaccines that protect us against disease. You're gonna start over. Can I just start from these solutions include vaccines that protect us against disease? Yes, that would be perfect. Okay. So these solutions include vaccines that protect us against disease and prepare us to fight pandemics. So this figure depicts the continuum of translational science that translates the set processes of turning observations into healthcare solutions. And today I'll use influenza as the case study and I'll focus on the stages from T0 to T2, which is the translation from basic science to first in human studies. So this is the most recent graph of the effectiveness of the seasonal influenza vaccines that have been delivered to date to you and I. And this graph comes from the CDC website. On the y-axis, we have the percent of effectiveness. On the x-axis are the flu seasons, and this is over the last 15 years, the most recent data available to us being 2019. And what you see here is that the effectiveness of those vaccines have varied from as low as 19% in 2014 to as high as 60% in 2010. And 60% is really the highest that we've ever really seen the effectiveness of the current seasonal vaccines being delivered to market. And so, in fact, based on this, Dr. Fauci, the director of the NIAID, he set out criteria for an effective universal influenza vaccine. And this criteria is that it should be at least 75% effective, which we have not seen to date, protect against group one and group two influenza A viruses. And this includes pandemic strains of influenza. And this embodies an idea of cross protection against different strains of influenza, including those of public health concern. They also need to have durable protection, and that is that they can last at least one year or at least one flu season or more. And then, of course, be suitable for all age groups, and that's from infants all the way up until the elderly. And in this vein at the VRC, our mission has thus become to develop clinical candidates for universal influenza vaccines that embody these traits, that they're safe, that they're effective, that they protect against multiple strains, and that includes pandemic strains. And also that protection needs to persist over multiple flu seasons, which embodies this idea of cross protection. And that the manufacturing of these vaccines are scalable because they of course need to be delivered to the demand that they're expected to be delivered, both here in the US as well as globally. And they also need to be deliverable in that vein. And that does mean that we need to ensure that its consistency and the quality of that product is up to par, which requires FDA approval. The delivery itself would require the correct partnerships because of course the NIH nor the VRC can deliver such products to market. And then we have the appropriate licensures in, in place because of course we are delivering candidates and they then need to be delivered to market. And finally, there's an idea of being super seasonal, which embodies all of these traits. And that is within the vein of something called pandemic preparedness, which is where we're able to very quickly deliver a vaccine that is scalable and meets all the rest of the criteria unexpectedly. And so now I'm gonna go a little bit into the basic science that helps us develop such a candidate and what we've been doing to date here at the VRC. So we have been 
since 2008, developing a body of work that leads to a development of a self-assembling nanoparticle, which forms a next generation influenza vaccine candidate. For those of you who don't look at influenza on a daily basis, or you're only being reminding of it now since your bachelor's degree or your master's degree. In brief, influenza has a molecule on its surface that's called hemagglutinin. It's the H when you hear about H1 and N2 or H1N1. And that hemagglutinin molecule has two regions. So this is it here, it's full protein. And it has a head and it has a stem. And the head, which is jutting out here on the surface, has a receptor binding domain, an RBD in its head. And that domain is what interacts with sialic acid on target cells. Red blood cells are a good example. And the stem has conserved sites on its surface that can also be recognized by the immune response. So in terms of developing a candidate, we can develop a candidate. In terms of developing a candidate, we can develop a candidate that has the, oh, we can develop a candidate that has just the stem on its surface. It can also have the full length HA on its surface. And if you notice in these two models on the bottom with the stem and the head, they just have blue hemagglutinin molecules jutting out of it. And that's because it has a single strain of virus on its surface. So that means that we'd have to make multiple with different strains in order to try to target different strains. Or, we can do a mosaic of different hemagglutinin molecules being co-displayed on one nanoparticle. And the basis or the rationale for such a strategy would be to avoid immunodominance, to have an accumulated breadth of cross-protection with this one nanoparticle, and then to target conserved sites that can be on the stem. And indeed, that's what we've done, which is that we've created this mosaic nanoparticle that does indeed display hemagglutinin molecules that come from different strains of influenza. And the body of work that we've been doing to create this since 2008, in fact, culminates with a basic science paper that we just published in Nature a few weeks ago. So at the basic science level, we have the scientific discovery of this nanoparticle. But there's a whole VRC clinical development pipeline to actually deliver this to a first in human trial, because at that point, we haven't really delivered it. We've just come up with the strategy. So this pipeline includes product engineering, and that is that we optimize the processes from a basic science level to processes that can be translatable to manufacturing. And then we scale that up so that we can actually deliver to scale. And we ensure as well that these vaccine candidates are then of a certain consistency, a standard consistency, and that they also have the appropriate quality to be delivered to in-human clinical trials. They're vialed and they're capped, which is a process in itself to ensure that that quality of product is delivered. And then we utilize industry partnerships to be able to test these vaccines or to have different iterations of those vaccines to then take through what we call a development cycle. So here at the VRC, again, we have a development cycle, which starts with the basic research, because our mission is driven by research. We then go through process development, where we do have our own process development lab laboratory at, the, at Gaithersburg. We go through manufacturing at our pilot plant in Friedrich. We vial, we cap, and then we go into the first in human clinical trials, which would be at a phase one, and then we have immune assays that address toxicology and of these and safety of these clinical products or clinical of these clinical products. And in fact, these immune assays also serve to get resources from collaborators like industry partners and licensees, which help us to get the next iterations of vaccine candidates into this development cycle. And so the cycle continues. And so I'm gonna show you a much larger scale. And this is the continuum of drug development from the basic science and then taking a product into market. So this is the simple phase. We have this mosaic nanoparticle that we have developed at a scientific discovery level in the lab. 
We've gone through the proof of concept of this nanoparticle by looking at the drug design and maybe doing some small animal studies. These are mouse studies. There'll be preclinical development that involves the process development and then the start of manufacturing. And then hopefully one would go into clinical development, which really translates to clinical trials, phase one being phased in human clinical trials. And hopefully with the correct approvals, we get to FDA approval and then launch of that product into market. Along the way, of course, we have to have interactions with the FDA in order to get FDA approval. So for those of you who don't know, I'm sure there's none of you here, the FDA stands for Food and Drug Administration. And then the arm of the FDA that deals with these relatively novel drugs, which are in fact not chemically based, but rather based in, the bi in biology, they then have to be reviewed by a Center for Biologics and Evaluation and Research, which is an arm of the FDA that we say for short as CBO. We will put in a pre-IND meeting for such novel candidates to understand what requirements would be necessary to eventually get into a first in human clinical trial and eventual FDA approval for, for launch into market. Once we understand what's necessary, we will put that into an application for an investigational new drug in order to take into first in human clinical trials. That's the IND submission. If we get a safe to proceed on the IND submission, and in this case, I have put the name of the clinical trial that is now underway for this nanoparticle called VRC325 here. If we get that safe to proceed, we can then proceed into this first in human clinical trial. Hopefully with time, we're able to meet all of the criteria to be able to put in a pre-biological license application meeting in order to understand if we're meeting all of the criteria to get this into market. And if this is the case, we can eventually in, indeed put in a biological license application, and that will then allow for the distribution of this, this, this drug to the public and to the market. There'll be continued safety updates, obviously, to be able to ensure that we are providing something that's safe all the way to the end of this continuum. But this gets even more complex, actually. So I said to you that there's manufacturing, and this is more or less where that starts to sit. There's the basic science, then we get into the process development, the synthesis and formulations form part of that manufacturing arm. And within there, the lab also plays a role in terms of doing the efficacy models, as well as the pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetic models that are not the same as doing the small animal studies. And you may be able to notice that by mere fact that we call the proof of concept studies what we call the animal models, models. We also do the toxicology and the safety studies throughout to ensure that we are indeed producing a safe vaccine. And then within the clinical development, there's first just safety with looking at dose escalations and the initial pharmacodynamics of these biologics. We also have the proof of concept once we get into phase two, which is where we can try to figure out what dose is required for such biologics. And then eventually the efficacy and the pharmacodynamics. So it's quite a complex continuum. And finally, there may be special populations that need to be accounted for, and that will come in at phase two and phase three, when we have enough data to say that we're certain that this is safe. And as a result, we need to tweak the dosing and anything else for these special populations. So I want to get into the basic science that a translational scientist would need to look at in order to feed into that continuum. And so we're gonna go back to the lab and to the scientific discovery. So I said that recently we published a paper in Nature. It was a basic science paper on the mosaic nanoparticle. And if you do take the initiative to read this paper, you'll see three animal models. You'll see the mouse, you'll see the ferret, and you'll see the monkey. And these weren't arbitrarily chosen. The mouse, the ferret, and the monkey tell us very specific things when it comes to influenza pathogenesis and the effectiveness of an influenza vaccine. The mouse can tell us about whether or not this mosaic nanoparticle is indeed a candidate to be taken on to, into the next phase of clinical trial, of clinical development. The ferret will tell us about disease outcomes, 
how are clinical manifestations likely to occur in humans? Can we translate that to humans? And then the monkeys can tell us about the correlates of protection of this vaccine. And so these are the different traits that we think about with these different animal models in the context of influenza. So the clinical manifestations of influenza in the mouse is not the same as in humans. And in fact, mouse viruses are specific to mouse viruses and we tweak them to be specific. They don't have the same genetic physiology uh, and, as humans. And so nothing about what happens in the mouse is directly translatable to humans. But what it can tell us is whether or not this candidate works in some animal model in vivo. And as a result, does it have potential to be a candidate for human trials? The ferret, again, it has different genetic and physiological characteristics compared to humans. But with ferret influenza, they do indeed manifest clinical signs and symptoms that are comparable to humans. And in that vein, the transmission studies in a ferret would look very similar to the way that transmission happens in a human population. And so it tells us a lot about whether or not the vaccine candidate, in this case, the mosaic nanoparticle, can prevent the disease burden. And then finally, the monkeys, we say NHPs in the basic science land, which stands for non-human primates. So their genetics and physiology are quite similar to humans. They don't manifest disease in quite the same way. And so transmission studies can't be um, translated to humans, but what can be translated is the immune processes and any monoclonal antibodies that we do see in the monkeys, we can then translate that back to humans to give us an idea of what are the correlates of protection that could be protecting against disease with these vaccines. So here are the examples of what that looks like in the paper, but if you're looking at it from a translational science perspective, I'm going to show you some graphs that have all of these mouse models vaccinated with the seasonal vaccine with a cocktail of nanoparticles where each nanoparticle only has one viral variant of that HA molecule on it. So in other words, to have four of them, you need to have four different nanoparticles that are distinct from each other. And then there's the mosaic that has all four of those nanoparticles co-displayed in a single particle. And on the graphs themselves, the gray dots are those animals that have been vaccinated with the seasonal vaccine. The green dots are those vaccinated with the cocktail and the pink dots are those vaccinated with the mosaic. So in this instance, I'm showing you the mouse model for what we call hemagglutinin inhibition assays. And on the y-axis is the, serial, the, the dilution of a serial dilution titer. And it's the end point dilution where you no longer see agglutination of red blood cells. And to just go a little bit further so you understand what you're looking at, essentially you will have a plate, multiple wells on that plate, and each well will have a standard amount of virus and a standard amount of red blood cells. You vaccinate a mouse with one of these three vaccines based on the group that they're in. You wait a few days, and then you will inject virus into that mouse to see whether or not the vaccine protects. And the way that you see that protects is the lower the dilution at which you require agglutination to be seen is the more potent the immune response. So in this case, we have virus that was challenged in the mouse that was the same as the hemagglutinin molecule that was co-displayed on the nanoparticle surface. And I hope what you see from that is in that at least three of these viral challenges, that mosaic nanoparticle is performing as good as the cocktail or better than the cocktail, as in the case of the B. yamagata, which is that third viral challenge. And so this tells us that this mosaic nanoparticle, even though not translat translatable from a mouse model, could indeed be a candidate that we could take into clinical development. And so let's now look and see what disease outcomes are in a ferret model, where the clinical manifestations are comparable to humans. So here I'm showing the survival curves on the left. When you vaccinate a ferret, 
and then challenge that ferret, not with the same virus as what is in the nanoparticle, but rather in this case, we've challenged a ferret with H5N1, BNO4 from group one, and H7N9, AN13 from group two, which are two strains of influenza that are known to be deadly in humans. And they are also mismatched from what is in the mosaic nanoparticle. And then so those two left graphs in that panel, all you need to focus on is that pink line, which is the mosaic. And what you can see is that those ferrets that had the mosaic, their survival was much longer than the other two groups. And in the case of the H7N9, it's very clear that the mosaic and the cocktail actually worked. Um, they outperformed the seasonal vaccine. And then after some time, when the ferrets are sacrificed, again, on the right-hand side, if you just look at the last panel of ferrets, which are in pink, on the y-axis of these graphs are the viral titles or the amount of virus that we see in the lung of these ferrets. And those pink dots are all the lowest compared to the other vaccinated animals, showing that with the mosaic nanoparticle, you have less virus being produced in the lung, or at least being seen or detected in the lung of those ferrets. And that probably correlates to the fact that those ferrets that were vaccinated with the mosaic also have better survival curves. And so again, this tells us that Maybe we can move on to a more expensive animal model and we can invest in seeing whether or not this vaccine candidate does indeed elicit correlates of protection that feed into these two outcomes that we've seen with the mouse and the ferret. This is indeed what we did. So monkeys were vaccinated with the same group of vaccines. And then the, the serum from those monkeys were put into mice. And then one looked at the survival curves of those mice over time after being challenged with those two deadly strains of influenza. And again, what you can see is that the mosaic nanoparticle in the case of H5N1 outperforms the other two arms. And you also see with H7N9 that the mosaic nanoparticle at least outperforms the seasonal vaccine just like the cocktail. And so this forms the basis from a scientific discovery level and reading a scientific paper with the eyes of a translational scientist to take this vaccine candidate into a development cycle process. So my colleague, Dr. Jeffrey Boyington, will take you through the body of work that makes up the scientific discoveries and into that weed that culminate into the development of this mosaic nanoparticle. But next, what I'm gonna do is take us again into translational science and manufacturing. Now I'm going to take us back to the risk assessments for manufacturing and thinking about the basic science and how it needs to translate to manufacturing. And we're gonna talk about early screening of research material that's based in the literature for manufacturing and development risks. So this again is the hemagglutinin molecule. There's the stem, and then there's the head with that receptor binding domain. And then there's a position 98 in that receptor binding domain that interacts with sialic acid on the surface of target cells. This is one of the strains of influenza that's in that mosaic nanoparticle. It's called h 3 2009. And at that position 98, the most frequent amino acid is tyrosine. And a less frequent amino acid, which is not quite visible here, but believe me, it's there, is an F, which is phenylalanine. And what is known about this is that in the literature, that tyrosine at position eight is associated with aggregation of protein. And what we decided in the end, after doing this early screening of the research material from just screening the literature, is that it would be a risk to the manufacturing process to have protein just aggregating and really clumping up different parts of um, the manufacturing processes so that you were not ensured that a nanoparticle would indeed have all of its components on its surface just by the protein clumping up or aggregating in places. And so with this, what we in fact decided to do is that 
all of these nanoparticles are modified so that position 98 is mutated into phenylalanine to reduce that risk of protein, protein aggregation at the manufacturing level. And my colleague, Dr. Lisa Kelso from the manufacturing and formulations arm of the VRC will give you a more in-depth picture of items like this. It forms part of what they call the manufacturing and biophysical risk assessments. And these help translate research grade material like this mosaic nanoparticle to a deliverable drug product. So perhaps what you've taken away from what I've said is that translational scientists really need to utilize a whole bunch of tools in their toolbox. They have to be system thinkers. They have to think about every step in the processes. They need to be rigorous researchers. You need to be a strong scientist to be able to read and understand the literature and design experiments so that you can play into the long game, which is not about the basic science, but actually being able to deliver a candidate that can go into first in human clinical trials, that can be marketed to industry partners, and then can be delivered to the market. One has to function across multiple teams, so you have to be a skilled communicator. You need to become or be an expert in your domain, in this case, influenza. Obviously, you need to be a team player. Um, you need to get along as best you can with everyone involved so that we can all do our jobs well. And process innovator I've spoken about already and crossing boundaries because these are novel candidates that really have never been delivered to market. The, close, the closest that we have so far might be the mRNA vaccines that are being delivered for SARS-CoV-2 protection right now. So again, the spectrum of translational scientists really is a spectrum. It doesn't exist with any one person because this process goes over the entire continuum of a candidate into a drug product. It involves principal investigators, physician scientists, program managers like myself, clinical coordinators, research coordinators, and the list can go on and on actually. So what I wanna end with is to show you that this body of work that started in 2008, really only went into the first in, cl in human clinical trials in 2017, which is almost 10 years after the first batch, batches of scientific discovery. We started just with displaying hemagglutinin on the surface of a ferritin nanoparticle in 2017, and this was that first in human clinical trial. We then went on to do a specific H1 hemagglutinin molecule on ferritin in 2019. We then went into an H10, which is just a different hemagglutinin molecule in 2020. And now we're currently enrolling um, participants for the mosaic nanoparticle that I have gone through in this talk. And so with that, I would like to end and I'd like to say thank you for listening to me today. I hope it was informative and I wish you the best for the summer and the rest of the year.